great. Uh, Zenevia Barrett received her doctorate in philosophy from the University of Montreal in uh, 2021, a dissertation entitled The Distinction Between Being and Innocence in Hervis Natalis. So now this is philosophy at College uh, Ahumzik in Montreal, Canada. It's uh, Zenevia, is, is it Ahumzik? Ahumzik. Okay, great. I'm sorry. Great. Uh, now, her talk is on uh, Marguerite Boret. So, uh, Zenevieve, please go on. Thank you. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. First, uh, I'd like to thank the organizers of this conference, all the New Voices team, for this uh, opportunity to present on Marguerite Porret and the Anil de Sol's relation to the virtues and reasons. And reasons. Marguerite Porret was condemned as an heretic and then executed in part because she characterized the most advanced state a soul can experience as that in which the soul has emancipated herself from the virtues. This is the main idea of her mirror. Oops, okay. This is the main idea of her mirror of the simple soul, which was first condemned and burned by the Bishop of Cambrai in France around 1300. Marguerite nevertheless defined the ban of Marguerite nevertheless defied the ban on the circulation of her book and had to face the Persian Inquisition in the autumn of 1308. She remained in custody until the end of her trial on May 31st, 30, 1310, when she was condemned as relapsed and executed the next day on the Place de la Grève. Marguerite wrote her mirror in Middle French but the closest we have to the original is the Middle English version. The quotations reproduced here are taken from the Martyr Grant translation into, into modern English. Marguerite's book is a dialogue where love, reason, and the soul are the main characters. For Marguerite, the simple soul would no longer have to practice the virtues because her, state of, because her state of alignment with the divine will surpasses its moral quality, surpasses in its moral quality the regular exercise of the virtues. The same would, on similar grounds, be true about the simple soul's relation to reason. The role that Marguerite attributes to the virtues and reason in the accession to these states nevertheless remains nebulous. Obedience to the virtues and reason is presented in the mirror of simple souls as preparatory to the state of annihilation. In her description of the progression of the soul towards annihilation, Marguerite distinguishes the moment where the soul obeyed the virtue and reason and the moment when she is emancipated from them. In general, everyone agrees there is for Marguerite a necessity of the practice of the virtues in order to reach the state of annihilation of the soul. Peter Adamson, in a history, without, a history of philosophy without any gap, says, Marguerite makes it clear that the virtues have an important preparatory role in bringing us closer to God. Peter King, in a recent paper, says, Marguerite holds that the moral virtues are necessary, a necessary stage in the soul's spiritual progress. But is there really, beside a certain chronological succession, a metaphysical necessity between, on the one hand, the virtues and reason, and on the other hand, the annihilations of the soul. This paper thus aims to clarify the relation that Marguerite establishes between, on the one hand, the virtue and reason, and on the other hand, the state of annihilation of the soul. For in some passages, Marguerite seems to assert 
that the simple soul could not have known this state without first subjecting herself to the practice of virtues and the exercise of reason? In the first section of this paper, I will investigate whether we can find any reason in her mirror, uh, for this in her mirror. In the second section, I will try to clarify what induces the state of the simple soul. In a third and final section, I will look at what kind of relationship the soul has to the virtues and reason once she is in her Hanilto state to determine whether a prior exercise of the virtue and reason is required to the state. Since uh, this idea of emancipation from the virtue by the simple souls is presented as fundamental to Marguerite's mirror, clarifying the relation between the virtues and the simple souls will shed some light on the thinker's position itself. From a political perspective, establishing that the passage through the exercise of reason and the practice of virtue is not obligatory would reinforce the independence of the simple soul with regard to what constitutes an institutional and male prerogative. The expertise and office of reason and knowledge about the virtues would in fact be relegated to an even more secondary role if the role of virtue and reason were not only preparatory, but optional to attain a morally superior state. In the mirror of simple souls, several passages present the practice of virtue and the exercise of reason as preparatory to the state of annihilation. The pre-annihilated state is described as an enslavement of the virtues and as a life of limited satisfaction. The well-intentioned soul desire to, take, to undertake virtuous works but the very will to do well and the zeal to perform virtuous acts constitute for the soul a captivity, impending her spiritual progress, diverting her and hindering her in her accession to the state of annihilation. The state of annihilation, on the other hand, is a state of complete rest and simple satisfaction. It is also characterized by the unenterrable freedom of the soul from the virtuous works to be performed, from the goods of this world, and even from spiritual consolations. Marguerite presents this marked difference as a possible progress from an arduous moral life to a life of radically higher quality. However, although Margaret says that the soul has submitted to the virtue and to reason before being annihilated, she does not specify why the soul should submit to the virtues and to reason to, or in order to reach the state of annihilation. Although the excerpt you see on the screen seems to insist on the preparatory preparatory character of the practice of virtues and the exercise of reason, it does not offer any reason to consider that a soul which would not have practiced the virtues and would not have submitted to reason could not reach the annihilated state. We can read uh, love that says, souls such as she possess a virtue better than any other creature but they do not make use of them for they are not in their service as they once were. And two, they have not served them long enough so that henceforth they may become free. Reason answers. And when love says reason, did, did they serve them? Love's answer. When they remain bound in love and obedience to you, Lady Reason, and also to, to the other virtue, and they have stayed in that service so long that now they have been become free. Marguerite here seems to give a justification for the transition from the state of submission to the virtue and reason to the state of annihilation. It is because the soul have served 
the virtues and reason long enough that she can now be freed from their bondage. But this justification remains incomplete so long as no explanation is given as to why, having been for a long time subjective to, subjective, subjected to the reasons, the reason and the virtues contribute to bringing about the state of annihilation. Yet Marguerite, Marguerite does not say why, having mm -hmm. served the virtues and reason for a long time would predispose the soul to annihilation or would be conductive to this state. In other passages, Marguerite affirms that one cannot be saved without the virtues. But these passages do not offer any reason as to why the practice of the virtues would be necessary for the state of annihilation. Moreover, these particular passages do not even posit the practice of virtue as a prerequisite to the state of annihilation. In fact, it is simply stated that spiritual perfection or salvation implies virtue. But the state of annihilation involves a very high degree of virtue. For annihilation consists in the intimacy with God, where the soul comes to delegate her will to that of God. So uh, to want only what God wants, and also because she then becomes, so to speak, an hypothesis of the supremely virtuous. For this reason, the virtue of the simple soul does not require the performance of the works of the virtue, the virtues. Therefore, the soul can meet the criteria set forward in the excerpts without having previously practiced the virtues in the mode in which the non annihilated soul practices them. We could moreover hope to find in chapter 77 and 78 uh, to which uh, Adamson referred uh, in the excerpt uh, shown earlier, a reason to believe that the practice of the virtues and the exercise of reason fulfill a preparatory role re to, with respect to the state of annihilation of the soul. The virtues seem to be presented there as disposing the soul to access to the annihilated state. They would be some kind of messengers of the divine loaf, the divine loaf, the divine loaf calling the soul and urging her to unburden herself of herself in the preparation from the, for the state of annihilation. But these messengers virtues, these messenger virtues are to be distinguishes, distinguished from the virtue that are pre, that the pre annihilated souls practices. This excerpt is not about performing works of the word virtues, but about letting oneself be taught by the virtue sent as messengers, messengers from God. It seems therefore that one does not find in Marguerite's mirror any reason supporting the idea that the practice of the virtues or the exercise of reason contributes in one way or the other to the state of annihilation of the soul. And since uh, in order for a practice or a use to be considered preparatory to a state, the practice or the use must contribute in some way to that state's coming about, this leads me to think that in the mirror of Marguerite, virtues and reason do not fulfill a preparatory role with respect to the annihilated state reached by the simple soul. Another reason to believe that the practice of the virtues and the exercise of reason do not fulfill a preparatory role for the state of annihilation of the soul is that other elements are presented as causes of the annihilation of the soul and that these causes are sufficient to induce the state of annihilation of the soul. First of all, God saves 
and God elects the soul for the state of annihilation. This is one of the cause of the annihilation. annihilation. But it is still necessary that the soul becomes aware of her nothingness. This very observation of her nothingness propels the soul in the state of annihilation, which corresponds to the suspension of her will for the benefits of its replacement by the divine will. The realization of the soul's nothingness uh, center, center certainly can respond to the soul's discovery of her sins. Although the sins of the simple souls are less than nothing, the soul feels them to be of supreme importance by comparison with the divine perfection. In addition to this moral aspect of her poverty, the nothingness of the simple soul also seems to be of a metaphysical sort. The soul discovering herself to be utterly nothing in comparison with God who is everything. The realization of her radical poverty, both moral and metaphysical, stuns the soul, propelling her into a plenary rest and a quiet satisfaction. The soul then no longer wants anything, for she has everything. That is the most precious thing one can ever want and now only wants what God wants. It is how God has transformed her into himself by enfolding the soul, which is by this discovery completely won over to God's will. The soul is not, however, annihilated against her own will. God does not in any way constrain the soul. It seems that the soul must have a certain disposition to annihilation, a disposition that takes the form of an attention to divine invitations and teachings. The causes are here identified are necessary to the annihilation of the soul and also citizen to it. If this recognition is correct, then the practice of the virtues and the exercise of reason turn out not to fulfill any role regarding the annihilation of the soul. One could think that the practice of the virtues and the exercise of reason could contribute to dispose the soul to the awareness of her weakness. But the manner in which the practice of the virtues and the exercise of reason would fulfill a dispositional role of this kind is not mentioned in the Mirror of Marguerite. One could also believe that there is some work that the soul can voluntarily perform in order to unborder herself of her will. But again, Marguerite does not spell this out. In this third and final section, I will determine whether in the relationship of the soul that has reached the state of annihilation to the virtue and reason, there is any indication that the soul must have previously practiced the virtues and exercised reason to be able to reach the state of annihilation. The soul, once annihilated, finds herself in a state in which she is entirely inhabited by God and in which she delegates and subordinates her will to God. In her annihilated state, she is so intimately united to God that she becomes some kind of an adjunction of God. Margaret says, and Love says, now this soul is so burned in love's first furnace that she has become very fire, so that she feels no fire, for in herself she is fire through the power of love, which has changed her into the fire of love. And also, now they have one common will, like fire and flame, the will of the lover and that of the beloved, for love has changed this soul into itself. 
although this soul it as this stage fully virtuous she's not proactively virtuous in the sense of being engaged or of seeking to be engaged in charitable works for her main activity is that of being in this state of union with god when marguerite says that the simple soul takes relief from the virtues the idea is not that she does so in order to experience a life of vices and licentiousness. On the contrary, the idea is that she no longer has to actively seek for to be virtuous because her intimacy with God has placed her in a condition where she is virtuous through her life as, of osmosis with God. Thus, Mar thus uh, Marguerite speaks uh, of the relationship of the simple soul to the virtues as one of subordination of the virtues to the simple soul. The simple soul presents herself uh, as in a state of moral perfection through her own subjection to the divine will. Since she no longer wants anything herself, except what God wants, her actions are perfectly ordained to the supremely virtuous will of God. The simple soul, therefore, does not take leave from the virtue in the sense that she would no longer act in a virtuous way, but because she is then dispensed from exercising the virtue in a voluntary way, exercising them spontaneously as a consequence of her union with God. As for reason, since it comes into play only when the soul has to exercise the virtue voluntarily, we could think that it is of no use to the soul once she is united to the divine will and no longer has to make up her own mind as to the virtue character of an action. But more fundamentally, Margaret sees through true freedom as the abandonment of one's own will. To, fo to follow any will not subordinated to the divine will, and even to simple will, would be to be a slave of one's own will. But when the non annihilated soul desire to act according to virtue and reason, she would not be letting God wills, uh, God wills work within her and would therefore not be free. Marguerite conceived the practice of the virtues and the exercise of the reason as a second best, undoubtedly profitable, but not comparing itself to the virtue of the simple soul, which abandons her agency to God, the virtuous par excellence. This soul who wants nothing but what the will of God wills within her is never non-virtuous. On the contrary, since she espouses the will of God, she has herself authority over the worldly virtue, which are subordinated to her. And what about the chronological, chronological progression? Well, it is just that, a uh, chronology. The stage of the spiritual life are conceived as a progression, but without an earlier stage being productive of a later stage. The reason is that the transition from the unhannulated to the hanulated uh, state proceed essentially through an awakening of the soul, which is also presented as a rapture. Although Marguerite repeatedly presents the practice of the virtue and the exercise of reason as prior to the state of annihilation of the soul, I 
argue that she does not establish the preparatory quality of the practice of the virtues and the exercise of reason with respect to the state of the annihilation of the soul. I also propose that the state of annihilation of the soul, as presented by Marguerite, does not require the practice of the virtues and the exercise of reason, since it is essentially due to a realization by the soul of her poverty, coupled with the disposition of the soul to receive the divine gifts. In looking at the relation of the simple souls to virtues and reason, I showed again that there is no evidence that the practice of the virtues is necessary to achieve the state of the simple soul. Thus, I conclude that the practice of the virtues and the exercise of reason do not clearly fulfill a role and are not necessary for the annihilation of the soul in Marguerite Perret's Mirror of the Simple Soul. Thank you.